shifted. Why? Because my high performance leadership project will be over after today. And I can assure you, I was not mellow or unleashed to this whole project. It was quite stressful, but it was absolutely something that I enjoyed to do and something that I am very proud of. Um, for those of you who were here when I initiate the project, as we go through the presentation, we would do a small recap of the opioid epidemic, what the issue is, and then we would go directly into the results of the program. So here's our recap. <coughs> The vision of the program, the project, was to do a training that would increase the number of responders to be trained to administer naloxone. Naloxone is an overdose reversal uh, medication that is used for opioid overdose. The mission of the project was to ensure that the responders knew about the opioid crisis and as gaining this knowledge, they were able to properly administer the drug when needed in those communities. I identified three core values as I worked on this project, service, integrity, and excellence, uh, because as you're working in the community, especially working with a different type of medication or a drug, you want to know that you're using best practices and you're also working with the community who has the capacity to administer this drug uh, throughout the process. So that's how I identified, uh, with the assistance of my membership, these core values. One thing that I wanted to work on um, for this project is my ability to persuade others. As you're teaching about something as critical as an overdose, you really have to persuade people to want to administer naloxone as we're working mostly with lay people, people in the community, as well as professionals. Uh, when people think of injecting or doing a nasal spray, they become very panicked and they don't want to do it. So I really um, had to work on and develop my persuasion skills to really encourage them to have confidence, for me to have confidence in sharing this information and for them to think about the big picture, which is saving lives. Um, once we talked about the big picture and the impact, people were really able to see themselves in this capacity and more willing to administer naloxone. And then I wanted to call the attention to the goals. You know, what are we doing? Um, we're just not giving out our naloxone, but we're trying to educate the community. We're bringing awareness uh, to those people who may be impacted with it. So as I shared this information and had one-on-one -on -one conversations with those individuals who were involved, they were more willing uh, to participate in the program, to get training, and to follow through as we were teaching them how to administer naloxone. So um, my persuasion worked very well. It actually strengthened my skills, but it also um, helped me identify some tricks in working with people uh, to increase their willingness to participate through persuasion. Now we're going to talk a little bit about the opioid crisis. I asked uh, before how many people knew that we were in the middle of an opioid crisis, and I asked the same question today because I see some new people in the room. So if you are aware that there is definitely an opioid crisis going on in the United States, can I have a show of hands? Great! As over the past uh, year, since 1999, there's been over 350,000 deaths to opioids. Uh, and these numbers are increasing daily as we're finding more and more people are using uh, synthetic and non-synthetic drugs uh, to get high. Uh, unfortunately, we're finding that a lot of the people that are now addicted to opioids uh, got into this due to injuries, car accidents, broken limbs, and you know, they just got addicted to the medication because providers were not, at the time, monitoring them as they should and continue to write prescriptions for, um, for very powerful drugs. Uh, then when um, our drug community realized that um, opioids were so addictive, of course, you know, people began to think of ways to make money and to recreate the drugs uh, into different forms and fashions, which is very dangerous as our young people, when they participate in peer pa peel parties, they have uh, synthetic drugs that they may not be aware of, and it's causing a lot of deaths in our youth. We've seen that in Macon, Georgia, where 12 college students were killed 
um, using opioids that they were not aware of. We continue to see this out in the Midwest as early as a couple of weeks ago when there was a pure party and some kids were killed uh, as a result of opioid overdose, not knowing that they were taking opioids instead of caffeine pills and other pills that uh, they thought were innocent. So definitely uh, there is a problem there. And, you know, we think about opioids, and, and I must say here that uh, we make the assumption that opioids are only used by drug dealers, but you'll be surprised at how many people that have medical procedures and are prescribed opioids and don't know that they're taking an opioid. Uh, so if you're having a procedure, definitely look up the medication you're taking. That packet of information that you're getting from the pharmacy, it's worth taking some time to read that to really know what you're taking and to make sure if it's an opioid that you're aware of, your pharmacist should tell you, but just in case that information that you need to know, not only to protect yourself, but to protect those in your home who may have an opioid addiction or may want to have access to opioids. So um, this is the slide that talks about what naloxone does. Naloxone, as I mentioned, it reverses overdose. So um, it's going to stop. Um, it's going to stop the. Um, it's going to slow the brain down and stop the opioid from attacking the brain. So what happens is when you take an opioid, your brain is moving fast. But once that opioid gets into your body, your brain starts slowing down. Uh, because of the opioid. So naloxone comes on and releases your brain function again so that you'll be able to function. If you do not get the naloxone, um, people can die within the first three to five minutes of a drug overdose from opioids if they're in overdose. Uh, one thing that we're finding is either as we administer naloxone, they're coming out of opioid overdose, but they're going back into the overdose. So we have to make sure that we have enough naloxone on board to re-administer it, to bring them out of it, to make sure that the receptors in their brain continue to function as EMS arrives and come to respond to them. So um, naloxone basically it reverses the overdose. It does it very quickly. Um, it brings the person immediately out of the overdose, but they can go back into the overdose. That's why you cannot leave them alone and definitely call EMS because they could still die after you bring them out of the overdose. So the target audience for the training that we did um, in May was at the scientific component Symposium. Our target was 300 to 350 uh, commission corps officers to really train them on um, using naloxone and to also provide some kits for them as well. Uh, to participate in the training, no experience was required, but they were required uh, to register so that we knew exactly how many people were training. Um, we actually chose this population because the Commission called the United States, uh, just like um, our uniform services, do deploy to natural disasters um, and to emergencies within communities. So we wanted to make sure that they were aware uh, of naloxone and how to use it. You'll be surprised that when there's a hurricane and we're evacuating people, how many people, if they're a drug user or have drugs, they try to use as many drugs as they can to maintain that high because they don't know when they'll be able to get back and get another high. So most of the time they will probably go into an opioid overdose and we need our responders to be able to respond to them and treat them accordingly. So the results, uh, the training did take place as scheduled in May. We ended up training uh, 173 commission corps officers at the symposium. Uh, it was, the numbers were lower than what we expected, but it was still a great crowd and a great number of people to train over one day, which was quite exhausting for us. Um, 18 of those trained were, re were trained the second time. Um, and the reason for that is because they were not comfortable with administering the naloxone, so they wanted to come back and be trained again um, to make sure they had the proper procedure down. So we uh, worked with them to be retrained as well. Um, there were, um, of the training, we had three of the, the uh, people trained were civilians, which means they were not a part of a uniform services, and the other uh, 155 uh, were commission corps officers. We did um, give out 59 naloxone kits 
to those people trained, and that was people that participated in the training did not have uh, naloxone on their person, so we provided them kits for their homes as well as their vehicles. So lessons learned. One thing, uh, we had a great training. We learned a lot. The Surgeon General actually came by our training and took pictures. He actually tested one of my classes um, after the training was over, which was very stressful. Uh, but they answered all the questions and they were able to demonstrate. So we did a great job with that. But we were very excited to have that support and that really showed us that this is definitely, opioid is definitely an issue and the administration is definitely paying attention to um, what's going on with that and how to work more with that. Um, so as I mentioned, we had 173 people trained. Um, we did get that support from the Surgeon General and at that meeting he asked us that we would do the training again the next year. Um, for that same conference to make sure that people are training. In addition to that, he's asked us to train at the AMSIS conference, and this is the American Association of Surgeon Generals, and all of the services are there, um, all of the uniform services are there, so he's asked us to come out in December to do that training at that conference as well, because he wanted to make sure that everyone had this training and everyone had the ability to administer naloxone if needed. So we submitted our proposal for that, and we're moving forward with doing that in, in Denver in December. One of the other successes was, as Kermit mentioned, Kermit and Yolande were on my team of doing this project, and I felt that was a success because they gave me great feedback um, as we were developing this project and moving forward, so we were all excited about that. Some of the obstacles were registration. Um, all of the people did not get registered in time, and they shut registration down ahead of time, so we did not get the numbers that we needed to. And when you're working with the conference, you can't always control uh, the registration like you needed to. Um, communication plan, there were some other um, communication issues working with the conference planners. As always, they have their plan, we had our agenda, and sometimes they did not match, so that was definitely an obstacle. It also snowed in Minnesota in May, so, um, so people's flight were canceled, and um, so that was an issue. And then some of the participants had problems with funding from their organization to get there uh, for the training. And, um, and then we had some conflicts in schedules. Some of the other schedules uh, for the training since the Surgeon General was there were adjusted, so uh, they had to do other things, and people went to his session versus our session. Um, other things that uh, we learned about was funding. Uh, President Trump has allotted uh, $27.8 billion to the naloxone epidemic. So definitely the, he's pushing money into the epidemic to make sure that the training, education, awareness, not only for us, but for law enforcement, for the community, is out there. So we're excited about the money that he's put forward. We're excited that he's supporting this and establishing committees for us to work with this more. As far as persuasion, as I mentioned, um, it was very hard in the beginning for me to do persuasion and to persuade people to administer naloxone knowing that it may not be successful. And that was something that I struggled with because unfortunately we don't save all lives and people do die after naloxone is administered. Um, the other leadership skills that, that I really uh, focused on was transparency, communication, direction, delegation, and support. Um, those are things that I had, skills that I had to really work on uh, throughout the training to make sure that everything ran appropriately and that we were on track. So in a summary, that was uh, the successes and challenges of the leadership training. It was a great project to do, one that I enjoyed doing and one that I will continue to do. So I leave you with this quote. There is no difference between saving lives and, lives and extending lives because in both cases, we are giving people the chance to live more life. Thank you. <laughs>